There we go. How about that? How's the audio now? Okay, now we're going. Sorry about that, folks. So many things to remember when I'm doing this. I got to click this button for a camera, click this button for a microphone. And so now we're uh, now we're finally up. Uh, welcome to the latest edition of Shop Talk. And thanks for taking some of your time here on this Saturday morning uh, here in Colorado to uh, spend some time with me and here in a few minutes with Lucas all the way over there in Cremona, Italy. Uh, we've got quite a few people on here. Let me just recognize people that are showing up here. Kathy, Kathy, it's good to hear from you out there in California. John Parcham also is on. I always pronounce this name wrong. I don't know if it's Gary or Jerry. Uh, in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. Peter Burroughs here in Colorado. Peter Donaldson in Mexico. Hola, como estas? And uh, we got Indiana. Jerry Hollick. Jeff Smith from Colorado. Jim Kirby all the way there in Delaware. Boston. Bruce Jones. Up in Calgary, Alberta, where, it's all, where currently he says it's minus 24 degrees Celsius. That's quite cold. We got Roger in Florida. Tom Martin also in Florida. Adriana. Hey, that's my wife. Hey, Adriana, how you doing? Glad you could make it. Thomas is on there. Oh, my gosh. Look at that. A lot of people are, uh, are coming in here. We got somebody from Italy as well. Welcome from Italy. I don't know who that is. If you want to give us your name, that'd be great. Anyway, welcome to the latest edition of Shop Talk. This one is going to be about violin making. Why about violin making, you ask? Well, because I just launched a brand new course on my website. The latest uh, course available is violin making with Lucas Fabru, my guest today, all the way over in Cremona, Italy. I'll bring him on here in just a minute. Uh, go ahead, and if you have any questions, go ahead and get those ready. Go ahead and put them in the chat box. My wife is helping me monitor the chat box. I also have my web developer, Cesar Tessarin, all the way down there in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He's helping monitor the uh, the uh, chat box as well. Uh, you'll notice at the top of the chat box, Cesar has put a, a link. We're going to be having a drawing today, and the drawing is going to be access to lucas's course on violin making now that's a pretty big drawing i would think that's a great great uh, gift and before um we get into that you have you have to click on the link then you have to uh put your name and your email address and then cesar my web developer is down in brazil and he is uh collecting all the names he's got a little program that he's written that when it's time to do the drawing he'll click on it and then uh, it, it signs a number to everybody's names, and then a name will be randomly drawn. And uh, I'm going to try and dial him up on my cell phone, and you guys can see that happen. Well, isn't technology great? We got uh, Lucas over there in Cremona, Italy. We got Cesar all the way down in Brazil, and people from all over the world. Cesar, we still have no audio, or is the audio up? Audio's up, right? Okay, we're good. All right. Cesar says hello there. Dan from Oregon, hello. Oh, we got a little bit of coffee coming into the scene here. There we go. Oh, there's my wife, Adriana. Uh, my wife uh, usually takes care of me, not only during the streams, but after the streams, before the streams, and every day of the week in between. Uh, but she brings me a nice cup of Brazilian coffee with a nice frothed milk to keep us nice and warm. I'm sitting in my basement shop. And for those of you who have been here in my shop, you know that uh, I have my furnace around the corner over here. And it is very cold today. It's not 20, minus 24 degrees Celsius like it is up there in Calgary, but it is very cold. And I have to turn the furnace off so that it doesn't interfere with the with the uh, transmission, obviously. And so I'm freezing by the end of these transmissions. Um, Kathy, thank you very much. It's a great violin making course. So much there. I certainly appreciate it. You know, Lucas has put a lot of effort and a lot of heart into making this course. I certainly appreciate it. We've been working on this course. I think we started all the way back in uh, March or April, but I'll let uh, Lucas talk about that here in a minute. I want to bring up my uh, my website here and just show you Oh, there's Lucas. That's the wrong one. Hang on, Lucas. I'll get you back in a minute. <laughs> I wanted to show you my website here. Uh, if you take a trip over to the website, O'Brien Guitars, and uh, click on online courses up there in the top right, and then uh, click on violin making, you'll be able to see there's the latest course. Oh, and look at that. There's also a 20% off on Lucas's uh, violin making course here for a limited time. I usually do a, a quick little promo when uh, when I launch a, a new course. And this one, we've decided to do 20% off. I've never done 20% off on a launching, so that's a great deal. 
Um, so take advantage of it. Use the promo code Cremona and uh, you'll get the 20% off when you check out. You'll also notice that there's some free videos there at the top. There's one with an intro. There's one that talks about materials and there's one that's a little promo thing we put together with a great uh, uh, lady from Japan, I believe, that uh, has, is playing one of Lucas's uh, violins. Some fantastic stuff. So let's see if I can get Lucas back up here. I'm going to introduce Lucas. Lucas is a violin maker in Cremona. And let's see, here we go. There he is. Hang on. Let's see if we got your microphone on there. Say something to us, Lucas. Hi, everyone. Let's see if, yeah, let's check if the microphone's You're hearing me fine. working or not. Yeah, are you hearing I me okay? Hear perfectly well. Good. Yep. Okay. There might be a slight delay because he's all the way over there in Cremona. It's after five in the afternoon there. It's nine o'clock in the morning here in, uh, here in Colorado. Um, so here we go. Lucas, welcome to the O'Brien Guitar Shop Talk. This is edition number 12, I think, that I've, I've done. And I certainly appreciate you taking some time to spend with us here this morning. And hopefully we'll have a few questions come in here and you can answer questions about the course. Um, let me just start by asking you a couple of questions. What Did you just wake up one day and say, hey, I want to be a violin maker? How did this come about? Um, it's a question that I could answer with a simple yes, in a way. Okay. Uh, there are some explanations, some, some reasons behind this, this decision, I guess. Um, but the short answer is a simple yes, a straightforward yes. Then, of course, as I was saying, I, I can't justify it in a way saying that I've always... I, I knew that I like working with wood. I started playing the violin, so I got into the world of music in a way, which is not something I had been introduced to as a child. So it was kind of mixing both things that I decided to do this. But at the same time, as I said, it was kind of an impulse in a way, because it just I just suddenly got the feeling that this is what I have to do. I had a kind of, let's say, a, a different life with a different career, which I really enjoyed. So making a decision, a decision such as this, it has to come from passion and an impulse. So you actually switched careers to become a violin maker then? Yep. I was studying engineering and I was working in a chemical company. Um, oh, interesting. Doing very, very different things, working with the quality, health, and environment, right. um, eyes and arms. Yeah, very, uh, very different Wow, stuff. how interesting. I, I didn't know that about you. Um, why don't we tell the people a little bit how you and I met and how we decided to do the violin course? And, and you can, I'll let you start and I'll add some input if I need to. I think it was, yeah, you contacted me after I posted one of my videos on YouTube. Yes. Uh -huh. um, I've... I've watch so much YouTube and I enjoy YouTube a lot, especially while I'm working. So one day I decided, okay, I think it would be fair enough that I start adding some contact to this platform that I really use. Mm -hmm. So I think it was after the tools video that I made that you decided to contact me. Yes. And then uh, I have to admit, I was a bit hesitant about making this course because I knew it would be a lot of effort. Yes. It would be a lot of time. But I guess you eventually convinced me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I really didn't do a lot of convincing. Um, but, but Lucas is right. I think I saw your tools video. It was a YouTube video, and I think I found the link on Instagram. I was following you on Instagram. And then there was a link to that tool video that was very well done. The production work was very good. And your on-camera presence was very good. And so I just sent you an email and said, wow, you know, congratulations. This is very nice. And by the way, I've been wanting to do a violin making course for some time. And I sent the email and I thought, well, okay, that's it. I'll, I'll never hear from him. And actually, it took about a week for you to, to write back because obviously you're very busy. But you wrote back and said, well, I don't know. Let me think about it. And then you contacted me again and said, yeah, I've been thinking about doing this. And so let's let's do this. The problem was we had COVID as, an, as a barrier, yeah. <laughs> as an obstacle. Uh, usually when I go and film these courses, uh, I go to the place. Like I, for, for the Flamenco Guitar Bending course, I went to Spain and I spent a month there, rented an apartment and, and filmed that. We didn't have that possibility. So I said, okay, 
let's let's do a plan B. Why don't you film it and send me the footage? And you did. You want to talk a little bit about how hard it is to film and be in front of the camera at the same time? I think it took me about double the time finishing that instrument that it would usually take me. Yes. It's, it's I guess that, that by the end of the course, I was much more comfortable and I kind of knew what to do. Right. But at the beginning, it's just trying to figure out how to put the camera right. And even though I had some experience by making the YouTube videos, I also knew that with YouTube, if I made a mistake with the camera, then it didn't matter. Now here I had to be sure that I was doing was right. Right. So so in that sense, it took a lot of effort and 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 a lot of practice. Right. Saying, okay, I'm going to to see how it looks like, and then I can be sure that this is is good enough. Right. And I had uh, Lucas send me some some practice footage, some test footage to make sure that you know all the cameras settings were okay. The mic settings were okay. And he did that and he did a fantastic job. Congratulations, Lucas. Cause I, I film my own courses. Okay. I know what a job it is to, to film your own courses. So you did a very good job. And one of the difficult things about filming this is that Lucas uses a lot of shadows and lighting when he's doing the carving of the plates. So talk, talk can you talk a little bit about that, Lucas? Yep, uh, I've seen some of the videos you sent me on, on guitars, and I think that as there, the surface, the surface of the guitar is flat, mm -hmm. then you don't really need to play as much with the lights as we do here. The the like, for example, I can say in my workshop here, I have um, six lights, if I'm not mistaken, and sometimes I switch some on and switch some off because that will give me the right light that I need to be able to work, for example, on an arching. Right. Because, uh, yeah, the, the, the most Im important thing for, let's say, regarding the light use is the arching, uh, because it allows the light allows you to see if there's a, like a bigger shade, then that means that you probably have a hole in that area and that you need to reshape the arching a bit so as to be removing that. So working with the lights was actually another big difficulty for for the course, let's say, uh, because it needed to to be able to if, if, to be visible for the people what I was doing, but at the same time it was important to see that that, that kind of mistakes such as a hole or or a difference of the arching. Right. And from a from an editor's standpoint, because I was doing the editing on this, Lucas would would film and then he would send me the footage and via Google Drive and I would download it. And sometimes it would take him a long time to upload and a long time for me to download it. <laughs> and sometimes we had issues, but it worked. But from an editor's standpoint, boy, that was really tough because the lighting had to be just right for Lucas to be able to see the shadows, but then it was too dark for the editor. So I'm trying to add filters and stuff. And then the next scene he was filming in the morning with sunlight coming in his shop window or in the evening at night when there's no light. So it was it was, it was fun. It, it was a challenge and I, I enjoyed it. It worked out really well. I, I think that's the that's probably the thing that where we like the one I had to to that I was telling you the most about it. The light here, the light there. I think yeah. that was mainly the. the I actually kind of like it because it adds an old world effect to the videos. Yeah. Old school. By the way, in this in this video course, Lucas only uses hand tools. So if you are into hand tools, then this is the course. I mean, sometimes I'd be watching that and I'd say, well, Lucas, why don't you just take that over to the sander? I'm talking to myself as I'm editing. But no, it's all hand tools. It's very, very impressive. Lucas has very good hand tool skills. Um, I'm curious. I'm just going to ask a question to hear to the people watching us. The people that have already purchased the course, and I recognize some names on there that have already purchased the course. Uh, why did you buy the course? Have you already built some violins or are you, do you anticipate building violins? And I know Kathy out there has built some violins and she's in the process of doing a cello. So if you guys would like to put in the chat box there, you know, why you were interested in this course. I, I, that would be some fantastic feedback for us. Also, my developer down there in Brazil, Cesar, says that this is the longest course available on the O'Brien Guitars website. It's over 37 hours, about 37 and a half, and I think there's about 160 lessons. Folks, that is a big project. 
I think I first contacted you, Lucas, what, about February of last uh, year, last year? It's about I, a year ago. I think ago. it was about February because it was just when COVID was starting. Yeah. I think it was just about February. And then I think I started getting the first footage about towards the end of April, first part of May. And then I started editing towards the middle or end of May. And then as time permitted, I would edit and then teach a class and edit and teach a class. And I've been very constant on the editing. It took a long, long time to edit. But I'm very proud of this one. It worked out really good. Uh, we have somebody all the way over in Tasmania watching this. Can you believe that, Lucas? That's crazy. That's quite amazing, yeah. It's 3 a.m. Drew Boyd has spoken. Uh, he's uh, there in Cincinnati. Robbie, you have spoken so highly of Lucas that I really want to learn from him. Thank you, Drew. I appreciate that. I'm sure Lucas does as well. The funny yeah, thing about doing you. these live streams is I've got two computers going here. I've got a monitor and a computer, and I've got a Zoom call going over here on one screen, and there's Lucas, and there's me. Hey, how you doing? And then I'm using OBS Studio software and YouTube to broadcast this out to the world. Now, Lucas can't see that, though. He can't see the uh, <laughs> he can't see the uh, the chat group or the YouTube or anything like that. My my wife is waving her hands here behind us. She says, "I think we have a comment or a question there, Adriana. What's up?" From Thomas, he's asking, "How did Lucas learn violin making? Did you just buy a violin making course on a website and, <laughs> and learn that way, Lucas?" In a way, in a way, you can say I wish I did, because if I look at my first instrument, uh, I know I could have done it much much better with an online course, having a video to watch and to be able to rewatch what I did. Right. Uh, I'm 100% sure of that. But no, I. that's the reason why I moved to Cremona. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to do violin making at the highest levels, this is probably the, the place to be. Right. Of course, it comes a lot of competition with that and, and, and it's not all uh, roses and flowers and sunny days. Right. Um, but yeah, I moved here to Cremona and I went to the violin making school. And then I started co to collaborating with one of the teachers at the violin making school. And until eventually I felt I was ready to start with my own shop. Mm -hmm. Now the violin making school there in Cremona, it's a four year program if I'm not mistaken, right? It's, it, it can be done in three or five years. Okay. Uh, that depending, depends on the level of the, of the applicant. Okay. And when you went in, you went in for, were you going to try and complete it in three years? Yeah, that, that was the idea. And um, I kind of prepared myself a bit for the exam. Although looking back, I was probably not ready enough. But you I have an exam to, to be accepted to the school? Is it... It, yeah, to, to, to be accepted into the third year. Oh, okay. If you want to do the... So I was, I guess in a way I was lucky and I was able to get into the third year because I don't, in a way, I don't think I was ready enough. Really? Wow. <laughs> then I, yeah, then I worked hard and, and managed to, to pick up with the rest. How many, how many students are, are there at the Cremona School? I know people come from all over the world to study at that school. Yeah. How many people? There are more more foreigner, foreigners than actually Italians, I think. Okay. And every, every year, except of course for for this last year, mm -hmm. uh, there's a record of, of inscriptions. So every year there are more and more, but, and I would say around maybe 60 new students every year. Wow. Between 40 and 50 and 60. New students. Yeah, I would say. Wow. Wow. Very interesting. For those that don't know, um, the importance of Cremona to violin making, and that's where Stradivari uh, worked, um, and there's a couple of uh, quick tours in the online course where Lucas walks around the city and shows a couple of statues of Stradivari in the museum and things like that. So uh, very, very interesting. Um, I've got a, I see a couple of questions coming here. Uh, so let me just, I'm going to try. Yeah, I asked the question about, uh, you know, why do people buy the course and have, have you built a violin or have you not? Uh, John says that he's built a couple of kits uh, uh, a few years ago. Um, oh, here's a question from Steve Foss. He's here in Colorado. How many violins do you make a year, Lucas? I would say I make around five instruments a year. Wow. Which is 
slightly different than, than by violence, I would say probably for violence and a cello. Speaking of cello, if, if, I see one behind yeah. you there on the bench. Can, can you pull that out? Yep. This there is it what is. He, Lucas has on. been working on a cello. If, if you follow him on Facebook oh. or on Instagram, you can see what he's been working on. Look at that. It's, it's my latest creation. It's going to go to a musician in Hong Kong. Really? So, so it should be finished rather sooner than later. <laughs> <laughs> now, when it comes time to ship that, do, do you ship it or do you deliver it? Does the person come pick it up or what? No, I ship it. It's a bit tricky the first times to for the packaging, let's uh -huh. say. But you just ship it. Wow. It's simple as that. It's quite scary. The, the first times it's really scary. Yes. Because yes. It, it's a sale and you obviously wanted to get into it. Yeah. the client in perfect conditions and you say this is going in a box so it can be a bit scary yeah. um but but there's a, there are a couple of companies here who do the shipping okay and they are, they are so used to like they ship instruments for for a lot of makers so they know what they're doing right right and is there any problem with the export import and that kind of stuff or do they take care of all that paperwork they usually take care of the paperwork. Uh -huh. I've never had any issues. Okay. I only had one instrument a bit, let's not really blocked, but but it, yeah, it got stuck for a while in China. Right. Uh, yeah, because of customs, but right. Eventually, they they, I think it was just more of a problem with the with the client who didn't know who had to fill out some documents. Wow. Wow. Um, I noticed a question here also from Peter. He's saying, given a good set of plans, could this course be used to build a cello? Could you build a cello or maybe even an upright bass from the course that you just put out on violin making? I guess I would have to ask for a more specific question regarding, uh, like, for example, obviously, some of the measures and the thicknesses are going to be different. Right. Then uh, the construction method is quite similar. Uh -huh. There are some differences regarding the setup. Uh, there are some differences regarding the neck joint. But in many other aspects, the construction is is very very similar. Just just a bigger scale. Just a bigger scale and. Uh, it seems like a bigger scale is not going to make much of a difference, but it really makes a difference. Right, right. Let's be honest. Right. Uh, but but yeah, then there are there are a couple of differences, but but the idea is basically basically the same. Wow. And how long does it take you to make a violin? And how long does it make take to make a cello? I would say from start uh, until it's properly finished, a violin might take around. Four months at least. Okay. How much I of think, let me just ask a follow up question to that? How much of that is actual build, and how much of that is actual finish? I think it's around a month and a half or two of building uh -huh. until the instrument is finished in what we're calling white. That's okay. before the varnishing. Right. Then varnishing. It depends on whether I'm doing a modern or an antique finishing. Right. Uh, but that can take around a month or a month and a half. Right. And then a couple of weeks for the setup. Okay. And then the cello, how long does it take to make that? I would say six months. Wow. Six months. So it takes you about four months to build a, a violin. You build about five a year. Obviously, you're not working on just one. You're working on several yeah, at the exactly. same time. Yeah. Okay. Usually, you, you work, like, for example, now I'm varnishing a viola. Mm -hmm. So while I'm varnishing, I can start another instrument. Okay. What's the uh, what's the difference between the, viol the uh, viola and the cello? Uh, the viola you still play the same way as the violin. Okay. Let's say that the viola, in in, in a way, it's a kind of a big violin, mm -hmm. uh, but you play it on a different scale. Right. And in the course, you, you don't have to stay holding the cello if you don't want to. You can put it back on the bench. Uh, <laughs> quite comfortable now. Security like, blanket, huh? To, to, to rest my my shoulders here. Um, resting my arms. And I lost my train of thought now. Uh, I was going to ask a question about, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, I don't remember. Um, Kathy has a comment here. 
I've gotten a lot from Lucas's YouTube videos. Yeah, by the way, if you haven't been out to Lucas's uh, YouTube videos and Instagram, follow him out there because he's putting out a lot of great information. But to see so much more detail and explanations in this new violin course, it's wonderful. Even though I'm doing a cello now, the violin course still helps. Look at that. That's from Kathy. So that kind of answered our question about there. That, yeah, you can yep. use some of the information in the violin course for cello. And uh, yeah, I think that would help. Oh, that, that definitely. Yeah. Like, I, w I think I was being way too specific with my answer. Yeah. But again, construction was a very similar instrument. They, can, they have a very similar structure. Right. So, so yeah, definitely, if looking how a violin is made, is definitely going to help making a cello. Yep. Uh, Kathy, uh, she says, I go back and forth between violin YouTube courses and whatever cello YouTube videos I can find. There aren't as many. Oh, maybe that's a hint from Kathy. She wants us to do a <laughs> cello making course. <laughs> Thanks for the idea, Kathy. Um, just a quick reminder, Cesar just put up there in the chat, uh, if you want to be enrolled in the drawing uh, for the free violin making course. And folks, that's a $497 value. That's what we've priced the course at. I think it's underpriced, but that's what we started with. And uh, if you want to be involved in that, then you've got to, to um, click on the link there. It's in the chat box. And then just put in your name and email address. That way we have a, a way to, to know who's entering the drawing there. So make sure you do that. Uh, Cesar, uh, down there in Brazil, how many people do we have uh, have already clicked on that link and have, in, have uh, uh, entered the drawing there? I'll give you, he's got about a 40 second delay down there in Brazil. So I'll give him a few minutes to, to answer there. Uh, Thomas is asking, any plans to do a cello course? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're still trying to recover from the violin course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe one day. Um, Drew is asking, have you ever built guitars before? No, I have not. And I'm going to be quite honest. It's not something that I'm interested in. Perfect. I okay. have to be completely honest about it. No idea why. It just, it just doesn't call me. I sure. guess in that sense, I go very much with which what, yeah, what I feel like I should be doing. Absolutely. And then the follow-up question, is there any, are there any similarities between violin making and guitar making, you think? Other I than we just get way, all dirty and work our butts off <laughs> in the shop. <laughs> in a way, I feel like you should be able to, to answer that, to that question better than I can. I think tonally, you've, you've seen the whole, the whole course. Yes. Yeah. The I think tonally, everything. no, there's, there's no comparison. Um, but it is woodworking. And so the similarities, I think, are woodworking, hand tools, uh, things like that. But uh, th what you're doing tonally is completely different. But the mm. other similarities are we, we both call ourselves luthiers. Violin makers and guitar makers <laughs> are luthiers. We spend long hours in the shop. We get dusty and dirty. And, uh, but, uh, but as far as tonally, I don't think it's uh, – I don't think it's uh, very similar. Steve says – Cesar, I signed up again as I signed in prior to the start of the chat. Make sure I'm only in the drawing once. Well, I appreciate that, Steve. I think his program would have weeded that out anyway. You can only sign up one time, folks. Don't try and beat the system here. <laughs> Multiple entries <laughs> to increase your odds. Um, Nathan says he subscribed to Lucas's YouTube channel this morning. Looking forward to watching. Uh, Cesar, we have 18 entries so far. Uh, oh, here's a good question. Yes. Uh, do you know uh, and use the techniques that Stradivarius used? That's an interesting question. Most of the techniques didn't really change that much. I mean, he used finger planes. He used a lot of the same materials that we use. Um, for, the, for the finishing, you will see it. Let's see. So for the finishing, this is something that I use, which is a plant. Mm -hmm. And this is believed, like, it's believed that this is what Stradivari used because you can find this plant around the area. Mm -hmm. So so that comes to tell some of the very similarities we have. Uh, then, of course, some of the techniques are a bit more modern. Uh, it's also important to keep in mind that Stradivari was building during the Baroque period so his instruments were Baroque. Most of them got modernized over time. Uh -huh. And that's the way that we know them today. Uh -huh. But of course, there are a couple of, of differences regarding that. Right. Especially, for example, the, neck, the bass bar and the neck joint. Because they used to put the neck 
with a nail, and we don't do that anymore. Right. So if you take it apart an old Stradivari uh, violin, you're going to see a nail in the neck. Well, actually, no, because they've all been modernized. But yeah. back in the day, you would have seen a nail in the neck yeah. joint. Probably a square yeah. nail, right? <laughs> I think they were. I can't remember. I have a couple of photos of them. But it's quite amazing. Sometimes you get even like two or three nails in a very small surface, and you were like, why were you doing that? <laughs> But I guess he, he knew better. Wow. That's very interesting. Um, let's touch on the finishing a little bit. Finishing is a problem. There's one of the similarities between violin makers and guitar makers. Violin or uh, uh, finishing in general is a real problem for for instrument makers. And I remember when I was teaching a Luthery course at a college here, uh, I hired a violin maker to teach a course up there for a few years, and it was a very popular course. But when it came time to do the finish work, he was doing his finish work, and I was doing my finish work with my students at the same time. And the guitar builders, they had to be flawless, I mean, like water, smooth and shiny. And the violin guys are distressing the instruments and antiquing the instruments and just wiping stuff. Oh, that's good enough. And I said, you know... I was very envious. I said, I wish I could make my guitars look like that. <laughs> but in the violin course, <clears throat> Luke was, was very smart. He decided to show two techniques, a modern approach to finishing and the antique approach to finishing, where you actually do the distressing and the uh, things like that. And you mentioned that plant. What was the name of that plant? Remind me again. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. In, it wasn't Willow, was it? English. Was it Willow? No, no, no. It had, uh, I, I remember. Think horse weed, maybe. Ho horse, yes. It had something with horse in there. I remember that. Um, and it's uh, interesting that, that that's what they use for sandpaper. And Lucas shows all this in the video. And how long you soak it in the water determines the grit, let's say, of, of, the, of the plant or the sandpaper. Uh, if you leave it in more, it becomes softer, and therefore it's a finer grit. Fascinating. And Lucas shows that in the video of how to sand the, the instrument with that little piece of, of, of uh, bark or whatever it is. Adriana, you got a question there? Yes. The, the version of the Blue Moon Planes besides the Ibex? Um, the question is, do you use planes besides the Ibex? The Ibex is that little finger plane, obviously. Um, okay. So go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, just for a couple of things, uh, for the joints and to square to square the the blocks of wood after the joints, mm -hmm. and to prepare the scroll. I think those those are the only moments where I use them. Mm -hmm. And then you also, I think you used a what was a number five jack plane or a number four smoother plane in the video. I also use. Let's see, have it here. I also use this one. Yes, I remember that one. Oh yeah, I uh, use them for the neck joint as well. Mm -hmm. The bigger planes, right? Folks, I'm yeah. telling you, it's it's amazing what Lucas can do with with hand tools. I mean, the scroll is all done with hand tools, you know, chisels, and the the amount of scraping. My God, you're an expert scraper. When I when I saw you using the scraping <laughs> techniques, and he has these little custom scrapers that he's designed to match the scroll. It's amazing. It's very very interesting. Um, another question here. Uh, Where did you say that one was, Adriana? Uh, Thomas. Oh, here's a very good question. Most and and Lucas and I were talking about this just before we went on on the air here about how secretive the violin makers are. And that's changing. It's, it's starting to change. But here's something that, that uh, Thomas is asking. Are you completely open with your techniques or do you save some trade secrets? I don't really save any trade secrets. Um, this instrument that you see me building in the course, I already sold that instrument. Okay. So it has, it has to be made the, the way that I make it. That I make it. So that, that's, I guess, clear enough. I, I was I was very amazed. You know, I'm the editor and I'm watching all of this as I'm as I'm doing the editing. Obviously, I was amazed at the amount of information and detail uh, that that Lucas was willing to share. It's it's really all there. If you can follow instructions, you can build a violin. And it's interesting. Also, at the end of the uh, of the course, Lucas shows his very first violin. And then he shows the one, obviously, we built in the course. And he talks about the differences and stuff. I, want, I don't want to spoil the ending, but I'll let people uh, <laughs> uh, look at that. Um, here's one. What woods 
do you use for the tops, the backs, and the sides, et cetera? Yeah, let's just talk about some of the materials that you use on the yep. violin. So for the top, I use Italian spruce, which is considered to be the best. Uh, for, for all the wood that I use, it's very important that it's decent. Uh, so yeah, for the top, I use this one that comes from Italy, and I'm quite lucky that I managed to get it uh, split and not cut. So this way it follows the sense of the grain, the, the, that the right direction, and which should make a more symmetrical and more even sound as well that looks better aesthetically because if not, you can have a different reflection when chasing with the light. Mm -hmm. And for the back, the neck, and the ribs, I use um, it's Croatian maple. The important thing is that it comes from the, that it's Balkan maple. That's also the one considered to be the best. And um, then, well, there's of course there's ebony, and then there's the a couple like the things for the setup, which can be ebony or maybe some rosewood, boxwood. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the the different. What about the options. bridge? What do you make? The that bridge up? is maple. Maple. The okay. bridge is maple, and it has. It's very important there the cut. Mm -hmm. It's very important to check at the direction of the grain. And the consistency, the density of the wood, this is, of course, something very different to explain and that it just comes over experience. Right. Okay. And there's not even, there's not even a right or wrong answer regarding the density, let's say, of some of the wood. Mm -hmm. um, it it's, sometimes depends on how you build it. According to how you build it, you want, might prefer one or another, but then that comes out of personal choice as well. Right. Um, and Lucas covers that in great detail. I think that there's even a free video that talks about the materials that he uses. Um, somebody is asking here uh, how to sign up for the course. And let me just answer that. Oh, Cesar answered that? Okay, well, let me just answer too. Just go out to my website, obrianguitars.com, click on online courses, and then you have a list of all the courses that are available there. Uh, the top left one, the very last one that we launched, is Lucas's uh, violin making course. So just click on that, and then it's just a normal shopping cart, like internet purchase. Um, horse tail or horse hair is the plant. No, horse tail. Horse, horse hair tail. or horse tail. I don't remember which. I translated it in the in the course, um, but that's what they use. And one person says it's also used to sand woodwind reeds. How interesting! I didn't know yeah. that. Okay, also... And we we also ahead. use... Uh, I, I didn't do it on the course because I don't do it anymore. I did it for a while. I did it just for the neck, mm -hmm. which is uh, fish skin. Fish skin. I've heard of people using shark skin as an abrasive uh, before. The, this, this is a yeah, different type of fish. I can remember. I don't know the 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 name of it in, in English. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a very long preparation. It takes a lot of time to prepare it because you need to froze it. Yeah. And then you need to remove the, the meat. And then right. it takes a lot of time. It stinks if you don't do it right. <laughs> and you can get to the same result with this plant. You just have to repeat it some more times. Okay. Um, speaking of other, th other things about the course, the finishing aspect, um, the violin uh, varnish recipes. Uh, those are very secretive and each maker has their own little secret sauce that they produce. And Lucas shows the old recipes from Stradivarius time. I think you also have kind of a modern approach and yep. it's all in the course. There's one, there's one which is it's not, like some people say that it's, it was just by Stradivarius. Some people say that it was not, uh, but let's say it's the most, the oldest and most well-known recipe uh, for, for violin making, and then yes, a more modern approach because that one, not really, a lot of people don't really use it any, anymore. Yeah, and Lucas shows how to extract the dyes out of all the materials and the woods and stuff and get the colors, and it's very, very interesting, it's fascinating. Uh, I really enjoyed editing this. Um, let's go with a couple more questions here. Alfred is asking, would you ever use a CNC to make the body of a violin to be exactly like a CAT scan of a famous violin? Very interesting. So no, only hand tools, old yeah, school. The, ans the answer is no. Yeah, uh, but but I'm not. I'm not. Don't want to say it's wrong. Right. It's just not. It's just not what I'm interested in. Okay. Um, Bill is asking, do you cover plate tuning during the build? I mentioned it. Um, 
the thing I, I mentioned it, and I think I attached some documents for God. I remember that. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so you will find the the information and and in the documents it says as well where you have to remove to get to those tunings. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't go fully into detail, like massively, on that because, to be fair, most people don't use it. Mm -hmm. And I even think that one of my better sounding instru instruments uh, didn't match the tunings at all. Right. Uh, and, and I remember I sold that instrument almost immediately <laughs> to, to a soloist. So I think those things are important up to a certain point. Okay. And also as well, it's very, very deep things. Uh, and and it's it's a, a bit about experiencing as well, right? Because it will depend on the arch. As I said, it, it's important up to a certain point. So according to the arching and the type of modern instrument, it will start making some more differences. But then uh, it's probably better to make a couple and start getting an idea. Right. Uh, Lucas makes, mentioned some documents. Each chapter of the violin course has uh, some downloads, uh, a bunch of PDF files with measurements, specs, uh, history lessons, uh, things like that. So as you get into, for example, scroll carving, you, you go to the download section of my website, and you can download all the PFs, PDFs, all the measurements and things. And uh, fascinating. When you get to the uh, recipe of the violin varnish, there's some downloads that have the recipes there. And so it's fascinating. Uh, let's see here. Greg Robinson, I am so enjoying this. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying this, Greg. Thank you for letting us know. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, Drew, my bet that learning to make a violin will help me be a better better at making guitars. I'm I'm bet that's probably true, Drew. Uh, Drew there. Uh, along the lines of woods, are the tops book matched like a guitar, or are they a single plate? Oh, they're two two pieces. Two pieces. Have you ever made there a single are, plate? Some, I haven't. I know some people have, but 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 it's not really something that people do, let's say. Okay. All right. Um, John Parcham, what is the best way to attack the course? For example, watch the entire course and go back chapter by chapter while building or start by watching a chapter and building section by section. What would you recommend, Lucas? I would probably say to, to at least give it a quick glance to everything first. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the best way uh, and then, yes, yeah, start focusing on chapter, chapter by chapter. Yeah. And of course, yeah, the, the great thing about videos is that you can go back and you always have someone next to you doing it at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, so you, I, I would emphasize as well on before doing something, just watch it right before. Right. Like that... if you're doing the corners, give it a look to how to make the corners right before getting into that. Right. Um, that's what I also recommend for my courses. People kind of at least watch it and then go back chapter by chapter. And, and you can put, you know, you can go to your to your shop and dial it up on your iPad and stream the lesson as you're working on it. So that way you can follow. Uh, folks, just a quick reminder, we're running out of time here. So if you got a quick question, try and get it in. Also, if you want to be in the drawing, be eligible for a free violin making course that Lucas is going to give away here. Go ahead and click on that link at the top of the chat box there. Go ahead and get your email and your name in there so we know who to contact. And we're going to be doing the drawing here in a few minutes. So uh, Cesar down there in Brazil, that's a heads up for you as well. Uh, let's see. What is the best way to attack the course? We already answered that one. Do you use any process or processes to enhance the tonal qualities of the wood you use in guitar making? Uh, that sounds like a guitar making uh, I, he's probably talking about, um, uh, you know, tr uh, treating the wood, uh, thermal treating, uh, torrified. Uh, no, I don't. And uh, do you do any of that, Lucas? Do you do any treating no, of the wood no, or anything? No. How long do you that's, let, how long do you let your wood spot. dry before you use it? Well, I have very old wood. I think my spruce is over 30 years old. Okay. Um, the maple it has to be at least seven until I use it, but I think most of the one I have is even older. Right. Okay. Do you so, do you prefer when you purchase air dried or kiln dried? Does it make a difference for you? Uh, to be honest, I tend to buy wood that's quite fresh. 
So it's me the one seasoning it. Okay. Whenever I, wherever I buy wood that has already been seasoned, it's usually air dry. Okay. Um, well, let me just run over to uh, Lucas's website real quick here. Let me see if I can pull that up um, because I wanted to, I wanted to show his website to everybody. And let's see, get back over here now. There we go. And we still got Lucas and I there. Okay. Um, this is Lucas's website, lucasfabro.com forward slash en uh, for English, I guess. And yep. you can you can scroll through his website there and see the beautiful instruments that he makes. In fact, I think there's a picture here, Lucas. Hey, there's the man himself. Look at that. You can't see this here, Lucas, but I'm looking at the picture of you holding the violin on your website. Um, there's a there's a picture, I think, of the violins. Let's see. Yep. If we click on violins, I think it's going to show the ones that we that you built for the course. It's going to take a minute here to show up. So we've got a little blank screen here because it's all the way over there in Italy. Let's see. We get some pictures up there. The pictures aren't showing up. There they are. Okay. The uh, Stradivari violin there is some 1707 is the one that you built for the course, right? Yes. Okay. So you folks are looking at what you and, can build in the course there. And then also the Ruggeri that should be right uh, right under that after one, that one. Yes, that's the one I for the antique varnishing. Right. So the the Stradivari, the one I showed you there at the top, is the one we did for the modern finish. And look how beautiful that finish is. Look at the scroll outline, outlined in black there. I mean, it's amazing just to watch Lucas work. And then if you scroll on down, you'll see an antique one. There's an antique finish that he did uh, also in for the course, and it'll show you the two types of finishes there. All right, now let's see if I can get back to the other screen here. Yep, we got a few more questions we're going to try and get to here real quick. There we go. I got it back here. Uh, how long will the vid videos be, uh, be available? Well, once you purchase the, the videos, they're available indefinitely, and my site is not going away. It's been around for 20 years and is not going away. So when you purchase the videos, you have uh, complete access to the videos and you can stream them. Now, this is the first course that I'm not allowing people to download, and there's a little story behind that. Some people have been abusing the copyright um, uh, privileges, and so I'm only allowing to stream. I want to protect Lucas's intellectual property. He's been very generous putting this out into the world. And on my personal courses, people have been abusing copyright privileges. So we're only allowing for streaming on this one, but it's available indefinitely. My site is not going away. You can dial in at any time. Um, uh, Here's a, maybe a personal question for you, Lucas, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but somebody's asking how much you charge for one of your instruments. If you don't want to answer uh, that, depend. that's okay. No, no, that's what, that depends on the instrument, but I'm assuming violin, uh, the price is 12,000 euros. 12,000 euros, okay. I don't, I don't know how much that is in, in dollars. Okay. Uh, Drew says he just bought some Italian spruce from Revolta. Uh, thanks for the lead, yeah. Robbie. Did you uh, do any business with Revolta? Uh, I, I'm i trying to look at the wood I have at the moment. I don't think I buy wood from them, but mainly because I already have a very, very, very good provider for wood. Right. I'm, I'm not discouraging people from buying wood uh, from Revolt at all. Mm -hmm. It's just that I already have such a good supplier. Right. And uh, I go directly to the forest. It's a bit more romantic, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you, may, do you plan to make the course available on DVD? No, I've already answered that question and the reason why. Uh, Lucas, uh, this is from Deborah. Are you available at any point for questions and, and answers during the build? Just send an email. Just send an email. There Simply, you go. Simple as that. Perfect. It might, take, it might take me some time. I have to admit I'm not great with emails, yeah. but uh, yeah. Okay. There you go. Also, uh, I have the uh, my online invitation-only chat group, my Google chat group. You're welcome to join that as well. Uh, let's see. How long will the videos be available? We've answered that one. Do you try to improve and make efficient your violin-making skills with each violin? If so, what's the most recent change you've made? Absolutely. 
like they, they, in this profession, you never stop changing and you never stop learning. Mm -hmm. I think uh, one of my recent changes was the borders, uh, the edges, the shape of the edges. Uh, I, yeah, I changed completely on that. Okay. I went for a different style. It's very difficult to to explain exactly how I did what I did, and then, in a way, it's such a minimum difference. But for me, it looks massive, massive change. Okay. I think that that was the latest one. Also from the same person, Alfred. He says he purchased the course. It's wonderful, Lucas. Great job. I've been looking for an Thank online you. violin making course, and nothing comes close to yours. Wow. Thank you very much for the Thank feedback there, much. Alfred. I appreciate that. Um, this one, another question. Do you prefer lighter weight density spruce for your violin tops? Do you measure density? I know, I remember in the course you did a little calculation for density. Yeah, I calculate the density and I work a lot with density. I also recommend there on the course. Um, it's something important to keep in mind, but at the first time for the first instruments, I wouldn't take it as such as a priority. Okay. Um, it's just a matter of experiencing. Uh, for the top, I usually use around 0 0.4 and 0 0.45. It really depends. And for the back, I have it written down. I think it's 0 0.6 or 0. Point... I think it's 0 0.6. Yeah, I think you I give those measurements down. in the course, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, uh, if not, send an email and I can I can, I can, I can give the proper answer because I, I'm afraid I would be, I might be saying it wrong now. Yeah. Um, okay. We're running out of time here, folks. I always try and keep these shop talks to about an hour or so. Um, Another couple quick questions, and then we'll go to the drawing. So get ready down there in Brazil, Cesar. Uh, Lucas, do you prefer wide or narrow grain for your tops and backs? Narrow, narrow, definitely narrow, but not too narrow. Okay, all right. Now, you're, are you talking, talking mainly for the top because the back is, you know, your your fiddle back? For, for both. Okay, for both. I prefer for both to be narrow and straight. Okay. Uh, another quick question. Um, are the pegs and the tailpiece making part of the course? They're not because most makers nowadays buy them and I would definitely recommend buying them. Okay. Uh, a couple of reasons is because it would save a lot of time. It's cheaper because getting the wood that is necessary to make the tailpiece and pegs can be very, very, very difficult. Okay. Like really difficult. And also there are woods, like for example, you will see me with ebony. I have quite a bad allergy to it. So if I had to make a tailpiece or packs out of ebony or rosewood, uh, it would kill me, literally. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, uh, another quick question from, uh, uh, let's see, how long have you been a luthier? Uh, I think around seven, eight years, something like that. Okay. Very good. But so, you were born I, to be a I luthier. Never, I, <laughs> I never take it in, in, in years, in a way. I, I don't think it's fair right. because I worked the first, the very, very first years, I still do nowadays, but the very first years I used to work around 12 hours a day. Uh -huh. I never went on holidays. I worked on weekends. So I always say that's like working double the time, quite right. literally. Yeah. Um, my wife just put a little uh, blurb in the chat. If we're not able to answer all your questions, please email. We're always on a time constraint here. I've got a hockey game with my daughter here in a few minutes. I've got to get away too. And I'm sure Lucas has a ton of work to do. You know, Lu Lucas is like most luthier luthiers. He works 24 seven. I'll contact him on the weekends thinking I'm interrupting his weekend and nope, he's in the shop working. It's, it's amazing. Uh, just I one think more. We, even, I, we met this, uh, on, on Christmas. We did. I think so. Or, or, or New Year. But... I think, and you were working and I was working. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. To, to, I remember saying, hey, I'm sorry to interrupt your your holidays. He said, no, no, I'm working. I said, oh, me too. <laughs> okay. Just uh, let's see. Thomas is asking, do you play the violin? I think you answered that. You said you played the violin, right? I used to. No, now I don't anymore. And the answer there can be also be very clear. It's I don't want my hobby to be related to what I do most of the day. Okay. Um, any difference tonally between European maple and American maples? Probably. I'm not very familiar with uh, with American maple, mm -hmm. but I'm quite sure the density is very different, even, even because the maple from Croatia is very, very different to the maple from Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. So 
even having such a small uh, difference in, in distance and in weather conditions make a very big difference in tone. Okay. Lucas, are you open to visitors in your website? I know we're in COVID restrictions right now, but normally do you accept visitors in your website? Uh, I do, but it's not something that happens very often. Okay. Let's Sorry. say, uh, because we, we are a lot here and I don't have the workshop with a window out. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a couple of shops which, which do, and usually they're the ones who get the visitors. But if someone's willing to, to visit them, they're more than welcome. Okay. Just one more quick question came in, and then we're going to cut off the questions and go to the drawing. This one's from Bruce. How do violin makers identify their violins? Like headstocks do for guitars? For example, guitar makers, the rosette and the headstock defines the maker. Is it the same for violins? There are a lot of things, and at the same time, there are known things, let's say, because it's very, uh, let's say that the level of violin making nowadays, it's so high, especially here, and there are some uh, things that we need to make sure that they're right and very similar, that it, that it can be very dif difficult. But a lot of people do it according to the corners, the corners of the purfling, the scroll is, of course, another way, part where you have a lot of, a lot not where you have some creativity. So those are, are, are some some aspects. The varnish. The varnish, yeah. The varnish. Okay. All right, folks. Well, we need to cut off the questions. I'm going to grab my cell phone here. I always like to call my developer down there in Brazil and get him on the line. And then I'll show actually the drawing here. So if you'll just bear with me here just for a second, I'm going <clears> to <throat> call my developer down there in Brazil. There we go. We're going to dial in technology great these days, folks. We can do a lot of things. Lucas, or Lucas, or Cesar. <laughs> How you doing? Okay, are you ready for the drawing? 25 entries, okay. Okay, he's ready to roll the dice. I'm going to try and hold this up to the camera here, and you folks can see. Uh, let's see there. We got 25 entries. Okay, go ahead and hit the, go ahead and hit generate, and let's see who's going to win. Entry number 21. Who is number 21? Duarte Espinola. Okay, now Duarte Espinola. I know there's a little uh, delay here, but you need to make uh, this known in the chat box that you're still with us. Duarte Espinola, are you there? If you're not there, we're going to try and draw somebody else. So let's give him a few minutes here. Duarte Espinola. Anybody see Duarte in there? He, he must have a different name because I don't rem remember seeing that name in the chat. I don't see it anywhere. Anybody see that? Duarte Espinola, going once. Oh, no. How many people are online, Adriana? We have 59 people, Lucas. Boy, you're famous. That's that's pretty good on a Saturday morning here in the United States to have 59 people watching us yak here. This is pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. Duarte, are you there? watching too, Lucas. I know. Duarte, are you there? I don't see Duarte. Okay, Duarte, I think uh, going once. Wow, oh, what a bummer that he, he checked in and then had to leave. All right, going once, going twice, going three times. All right, Cesar, let's try another one, huh? Oh, wait, 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 he's here. He just showed up. He just showed up. Wow. Oh, man, you that was so close, Duarte. You almost... You almost missed out on the free course from Lucas. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so uh, Duarte, what you need to do is, if uh, if you haven't already, go out to my website, O'BrienGuitars.com, click on uh, register, and go ahead and create an account, and then contact me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wow, I'm starting to hack here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then go ahead and contact me with your login uh, username. That way I can flip a switch behind the scenes 
and give you access. So congratulations to Archie and thank you very, very much everybody for tuning in to Lucas and I here. And thank you, Lucas, again, for doing this wonderful course with me. I really, it was an honor to work with you and I had a great time. Thank you for the invitation here and for, for letting me participate on the course as well. Congratulations to Duarte uh, one more time. Yes. All right. If you have any questions, go ahead and just uh, go to uh, Lucas's website and he's happy to answer any emails, emails there for you. Um, Lucas, if you want to just stay on the Zoom call here, um, yep. you can. And I'm going to say over and out to everybody else here. So goodbye, everybody. And thanks for tuning in. Goodbye, everyone.